I'm Larry Ray, President and CEO of American Manganese, Inc. Listed on the TSX Venture, ticker symbol AMY, A-M-Y, with proprietary patents in the U.S., China, and South Africa. Our focus is on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. China recently legislated the responsibility for recycling onto their electric vehicle manufacturers and importers. For more information, please visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Ted Dixon, CEO and co-founder of InkResearch.ca, Canada's first online financial news and research service. Welcome to the show, Ted. Well, it's great to be back uh, on a, a sunny May day in Vancouver. Yeah, and you know, there used to be a time that would be rare. Now we're getting used to sunny Mays and Aprils. <laughs> That's right. And uh, for stock market investors, though, do they ever get used to selling in May and going away? You know, that's been the um, motto that I've been brought up with ever since I started in the market way back, uh, way back around uh, Expo and um, Expo '86. That would be and. Uh, it still exists today, so maybe there's some some truth behind it. And, and will that be a little sooner than usual? We look at the August uh, collapse to the markets. Usually things like that happen in September or October. Will things, uh, again, be just a little sooner than expected this spring? Well, these days we have these volatility flashes uh, seemingly coming out of the blue, very hard to predict. But uh, one area of the market that has shown a tendency to taper off in the summer is, is the gold market, and there's been um, uh, a, a, you know a number of uh, studies that have looked at uh, gold over the summer and gold stocks. And um, um, in our uh, Canadian Insider blog, uh, your, your listeners can go and take a look uh, at it. Um, we uh, reference uh, some work done by. Uh, equityclock.com and there's a chart on our blog that uh, shows you know over the past over a over a, uh, a multi-decade period how uh, gold futures do in a calendar year on average and what they found in the most recent 10 year period that they looked at was that if you had bought uh, gold futures uh, in the middle of September and held them and i e sold them in the middle of May like where we're we're fast approaching, that you would do better than just holding gold on its own uh, continuously through that period. So the sell in May and go away uh, has, on average, it seems it worked in the past it, for gold. Now the question is, just because it worked in the past, you know, will that necessarily work again this year? Well, that's interesting. I didn't hear. We've all heard of sell in May, go away, but buy in September. That That's kind well, of interesting, too. Well, it's kind of the flip side. You know, the, the sell in May go away, um, go, go away until September, basically, at least for gold. Now, for the stock market, you may want to wait until November, um, because, uh, because October is a notoriously a volatile month, and so and September can be quite bad as well. And this year, of course, we have the, uh, the showdown between, uh, likely Donald Trump and more than likely, uh, Hillary Clinton, and that will be good, I'm sure, for a few volatile days in the market. Right, and uh, of course, both feature different things. Hillary probably more predictable than Donald, who everybody admits, even himself, he's a bit of a loose cannon. Well, that's right. I mean, he was uh, today on a major U.S. network saying he loves uh, low interest rates and uh, likes debt, and uh, so... Little uh, little tidbits like that or can snowball into major headlines, and that's why I would be cautious about relying on the sell and may go away uh, motto this year for gold. It may well plan out, uh, pan out as usual. However, though there are a lot of uh, factors in the market to consider that are maybe one-offs uh, this time around, and the nomination of Donald Trump is one of them, but there are others, such as, you know, will the Fed um, re-reverse course and start to talk about tightening again? I doubt it, leading up to an election year. 
However, stranger things have happened. You know, will uh, will the uh, Bank of Japan, um, who surprised on uh, earlier uh, this spring with doing nothing uh, when everyone thought they were going to ease, uh, because the last time they eased, they surprised themselves and found them dealing with a strengthening yen. So the Bank of Japan is scratching their heads on what to do next, and no one knows what they're going to do next. I'm not even sure the Bank of Japan knows what they're going to do next, but what if they get it wrong? And, you know, will that be, uh, uh, will that drive a massive amount of money into the U.S. dollar? Perhaps. Will it go into, some of that go into gold? Perhaps. We don't know. So this is uh, going to be a summer of surprises. Um, it'll be a summer of surprises from the Donalds. It'll be a, probably a summer of surprises from the central bank, and I'm sure there'll be a few surprises that come out of left field that we, you know, that we don't know about. Uh, if we did, they wouldn't be surprises. But uh, it, it, it will likely be a, a, an atypical uh, summer, and that could, uh, you know, give uh, gold a bit of a boost uh, more than it usually would. So I, I would be a little careful on relying on that this time around. Uh, but on average. That uh, approach to you know, sort of pare back your gold positions, or at least hold off on buying until later in the uh, later in the summer, uh, has worked out. It seems, um, um, uh, according to the studies, anyways. Our correspondent in Japan, James Corbett, said the government said it's finished with doing quantitative easing. If they have a big downturn, their next shot may be giving people shopping vouchers. A- and before you think, oh, that's crazy, in two thousand and eight. 09 with the big recession germany's solution was was to give people a ten thousand dollar credit if they bought a new car and a year later they were out of recession well uh, it's affectionately known as qe for the people in some yes. corners and nothing would surprise me i mean nothing would nothing would uh surprise me by central bankers the only thing that surprises me is how the electorate have put up with this for so long. You know, we keep hearing this mantra from from all these central bankers. I mean, it's not just Stephen Polo's here in Canada; it's around the world that you know we're we're facing this monster of deflation, and we have to do everything to slay it, even if it means killing everything else off in the economy. And the last time I checked, uh, Jim, the penny was gone. And now I hear they're even talking about getting rid of the nickel in Canada. Well, why is that? It's not because of deflation. It's because of inflation. It's because our purchasing power from these policies, by giving these central banks all this power, has eroded our purchasing power. And, you know, it's continuing. So this uh, this obsession with uh, achieving 2% consumer price inflation is is now turning out to be just a stream of mad policy after mad policy hitting the market. And, you know, when is it going to end? It'll probably end when something goes extremely bad, unfortunately. And then you'll have all the politicians run around going, oh, well, we have to do something about this. This is unacceptable. Well, you know, why can't they do something about it now? That's what they're paid to do, you know. And But, you know, uh, that is just not the way human uh, behavior um, acts. And really, it's up to the electorate to demand that uh, politicians start at, uh, focusing on this. and Because if we don't, they won't do it. You know, they'll do it after the fact. After the horse has left the barn, uh, then they'll go running down the road trying to trying to catch it. And then, uh, of course, they'll spend a lot of money rebuilding the barn, and there'll be no horse in it at that point. So now is the time to put pressure on politicians to, you know, to try and bring some sanity back to monetary policy and, to stop this debate about you know whether negative interest rates are good or bad. Negative interest rates are bad. They're they're a bad idea. They don't make any sense. But Jeffrey Dunlap, you know the the largest uh, bond, active bond manager in the world, said you know these central bankers who are touting negative interest rates as a way to fight deflation are uh, you know are are total have totally lost it because negative interest rates are by themselves deflationary. You would never, you would never ever want to put money into the bank to save. Uh, to, you, you know, you, you basically are fearful of doing anything because um, you, 
are afraid that you your money will lose purchasing power. And so if if your money's going to lose purchasing power instantly, you're 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 just not you're just not going to transact. You're you're going to totally uh, alter your behavior in a way that's going to retrench in terms retrench your activity, not boost it like these uh, central bankers say you're going to. So we've got just uh, a, a you know a circus of, pol of monetary policies floating around the world, and you know Canada through uh, you know a miracle is basically not at you know not on the lunatic fringe at this point. However, you know, given our lousy trade numbers that came out um, this week, where we had a you know record trade deficit, I'm very worried the Bank of Canada is going to use that as an excuse to talk down the dollar, to impoverish most Canadians, but to prop up a few of their favorite industries, and you know that will set off a spiral of um, more more dislocation in the economy. So you know, uh, I, I am you know I am I'm worried about. The, uh, about the uh, outlook um, now for monetary policy in Canada, and I think that uh, that you know can be said around the world. So whether gold uh, you know does its usual uh, usual uh, pullback in the summer, we'll have to see. I'm sure there'll be bouts. We're seeing a bit of a pullback right now, and as we should, there's, uh, gold stocks have been uh, in overbought territory um, as we you know as basically as we started uh, May. But, um, you know, they've come off a little bit now. And whether there's much further to go, we'll have to see. Uh, traditionally, we would expect yes, but because we have so much uh, uh, in terms of experimental uh, and volatile uh, monetary policy um, in the world and, you know, and could, you know, strike us again at any time. We'll see how low a goal can go, but um, it, it may very well uh, surprise some people this summer. We'll have more with Ted Dixon right after the break. I'm Larry Ray, President and CEO of American Manganese, Inc. Listed on the TSX Venture, ticker symbol AMY, A-M-Y, with proprietary patents in the U.S., China, and South Africa. Our focus is on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. China recently legislated the responsibility for recycling onto their electric vehicle manufacturers and importers. For more information, please visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Unbelievable harmony, spectacular performance, the ultimate tribute to the Everly Brothers and Simon and Garfunkel, Bird Dog, and the Vintage Electric Band coming to West Vancouver Friday, May 6th at the K-Meek Center. Buy online and save at OnTourTickets.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Ted Dixon. Ted, the insurance industry is going to take a huge hit from the Fort McMurray disaster. Some say the estimate is at this moment, and we don't really know how bad the damage is, $9 billion dollars which I'm sure is far more than what the Calgary floods or the Calgary hailstorm uh, cost consumers who buy insurance. Well, that's right. It, it is a devastating development that uh, that's happened in Alberta. We still don't know the, the full uh, extent of the uh, of the of the damage, but uh, at this point, you know, I think that uh, there are um, you know, experiences in the in the past that have that have turned out you know for insurance companies to be manageable provided the you know there is one or two particular insurance companies that have exposure to that area um, usually insurance companies can manage these types of risks that's their that's their business that's their that's their expertise so unless we hear some news uh, and you know and, and if an insurance company were in trouble they they would have a duty to do Close that. Um, yes, you know it'll be painful for them, but you know that's their job is to is to be there for when these types of uh, tragedies happen. That's why they get paid premiums, and that's why you know most of the time um, their premiums uh, you know accumulate uh, in their um, you know in their bank in their bank accounts and in their asset accounts. But they know that uh, at any time they could be called upon to do uh, major payouts. So I would be I would be uh, Surprise if um, if any uh, any major uh, company is caught off guard on this, but that's not out of the realm of possibility. But we, we, uh, you know, once the the full extent of the damage is done, then you know, uh, all everyone will have a better sense of um, what 
the monetary costs are, uh, including uh, including financial institutions as well. Well, here's the danger of negative interest rates. Insurers, bankers, and pension funds have been horribly mutilated in Europe and Japan because of negative interest rates. Is that not a lesson about why we should not have them here? Well, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, the uh, you know, it, it's just ridiculous to hear these ECB members, board members, saying, "Well, interest rates are working; everything's fine, and there's been no problem." I don't know. Maybe they haven't looked, checked the, the stock price of Deutsche Bank and a, and a few other banks in in uh, in Europe. I mean, uh, there were there were worries not too not too long ago. I mean, you know, I'm talking weeks ago of Deutsche Bank going bust. You know, and one of the huge drivers behind that is negative interest rates. If you're, you know, bringing closer to home, you know, we have a very, thankfully, very solid financial banking system in Canada. But, you know, insurance companies need to make money to offer premiums. So, you know, we talk about, um, you know, the drive for uh, higher inflation. Well, these investment, uh, so these, these central bankers, they're getting inflation in all the wrong places so after this uh uh bill comes in for uh, alberta you know it's likely that premiums will have to go up because the, these companies will reassess the potential exposure um for natural disaster insurance now with close to zero interest rates that means they're not making as much on their investments that means Insurance premium policies will have to go up even more. So you're getting inflation on insurance premium policies. Now, Jim, do you know, is it, are insurance premiums captured in the CPI that these central bankers follow? Uh, I don't know. Maybe I they bet are. you not. Maybe they aren't. I bet you they're not. You know, maybe there's a small portion of it, you know, how it's allocated. I don't know. But if, you're, if your home insurance uh, goes up, you know, 100%, you know, over the next two years, that's a major hit. I, I don't care, you know, uh, where you where you live in Canada, where your income level is. If, if your home insurance goes up, that's a major bill you have to pay. You know, and I'm willing to bet that that comes nowhere near uh, Stephen Polos' radar. It will never be reflected properly in um, in these uh, CPI numbers, and we're going to keep continue. You know, we're going to continue to get these insane central bank policies that just, you know, keep, you know, making things worse. So, you know, the the outlook for, um, uh, you know, the financial services area uh, is tough enough. You know, without these kinds of uh, problems that you know uh, we see uh, being. Uh, Delivered by central bankers in terms of bad, you know, bad solutions to very, you know, to very challenging problems because it just makes things worse. And if you let the, the you know, if you gave the, uh, the money markets a little bit more say into where interest rates should be priced, then when we have these disasters that happen, uh, like we're seeing in Alberta, you know, the private sector would be better uh, equipped to be able to handle it. So, and you know, instead, now what are we going to get? We're going to have more. There's going to be more more weight, weight put on the shoulders of the federal and provincial governments. And unfortunately, Alberta is, is the government is not in a great position to um, take on a lot more debt. So, um, yeah, it is very difficult. It's a very difficult financial time, and you know, and, and uh, you know, of course, that pales in comparison to the to the human cost of um, the destruction that, that's uh, gone on. But, uh, you know, it's a burden that, um, as uh, an industry, the financial services industry is going to have to shoulder, and uh, I'm willing to bet that uh, the taxpayers are going to have to shoulder uh, quite a bit of that as well. The cost of living index, of course, is totally a piece of junk because the governments exclude housing and fuel costs, saying they're too volatile. Well, excuse me, in the Vancouver area, houses cost 25% more over one year. Shouldn't that be written into the cost of living? Well, it's the biggest purchase a consumer will ever make in their life, and it's not included in the CPI. I mean, that right there tells you how ridiculous the whole situation is and how, you know, the, uh, how the policymakers have failed, uh, to, uh, pro- properly manage the, the well, the financial well-being of this country. And, you know, and it spans different parties. So, you know, it, it, 
it goes uh, right across the liberal conservative uh, spectrum. You know that you, you can't blame one particular one particular prime minister or finance minister for that. There have been, but you know, both both you know, Stephen Harper's had a chance to fix it. Paul Martin had a chance to fix it. Justin Trudeau now has, now has a chance to fix it. We we will see. You know, the the, the mandate for the central bank is is coming up again, and now is a well, now is time to refocus the central bank on truly managing its affairs for the overall well-being of the economy and people, not just a select few industries, not just exporters, for everyone. And so that will be a tough pill to swallow for, you know, some groups that have, I believe have got preferential treatment from this current, um, from this current, uh, central bank administration. But, you know, it's their job to manage uh, on behalf of all Canadians, not just a few. And, uh, you know, the, the poor have been taking it really on the chin under this uh, low, loony, uh, low loony policy of uh, Stephen Polo's. And they're, you know, why should they be, why should they be carrying the, the weight on their shoulders? You know, that, um, that when every time the loony goes for a big uh, swan dive, that uh, it's the poor who have to pay more for their uh, their their meals, and uh, it you know that's a bigger part of their budget, you know. And and if you're making uh, two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year, well, you know maybe you know if you have to pay uh, eight dollars for uh, for you know for a pound of tomatoes, you know um, maybe that's not such a big deal. But uh, if you're making a tenth of that, it's a big deal. Right, food costs went up fourteen percent over the winter because of the low loony. They don't look at that. So a low loony will increase Canadian exports. Well, I, but look at our trade deficit. It didn't do it. Exactly. I have never heard Stephen Polos once talk about the impact of his policies on the poor. All I hear him talk about is how we need a lower dollar to help exports. That's all I hear. It's like a broken record. It's like exports are the own exporters, and I mean exporters. I mean price taking exporters, not not exporters who rely on value added in human capital because those exporters are not clamoring for a lower dollar. The only the only exporters that are going to benefit from our lower dollar are the, the weakest uh, links in the chain. I mean I mean sure every exporter will, will benefit from it, but in terms of needing a lower dollar to survive, it's you know, it's the lowest common denominator. And you know, is that really the type of economy we want where we have to keep driving the dollar down in order to keep the keep our exports industry standing. You know, I, I think there's some other alternatives to that where you don't have to ask the poor to subsidize uh, the weakest links in the export chain. You know, let's give this a, a, a complete rethink uh, and think about it in terms of all Canadians and not just, uh, uh, you know, a subsection of the export industry, which for some reason this central bank governor seems to be completely fixated on. Ted, with gold now uh, looking to be a good investment, is this a, a warning to people again that uh, we can never anticipate things like Fort McMurray and disasters, that having some gold, even if you're not a gold bug, some gold in your portfolio is a good idea? Absolutely. You know, and the best way to think about gold is as an insurance policy. You know, it's a polo's insurance. You know, it's, it's Yellen insurance. It's, it's war insurance. You know, it's just insurance about something that happens out of your control that could negatively hit your financial well-being. And so that doesn't mean put half your 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 eggs into the gold basket, but you know, you know, an allocation 5, 10%, you know, and adding to it over time um, either in gold or gold stocks, you know, does make a lot of sense. You know, and in terms of um, you know, capital gains and opportunity, you know, I think that's a, a, a whole different game and you would look at that as a separate um, uh, a separate item on your investment uh, strategy list. Yes, you know, right now we we're in a, a I think a pretty decent run for the gold market. But if you're if you're looking to invest to make money off of gold, I think that's a separate allocation in your portfolio, and you look at it that way. And you know, you have to have the right risk tolerance for it. But in terms of your overall safety for your portfolio, you know, having having a you know five percent exposure to gold over the long term makes a lot of sense. Ted, thank you very much for chatting with us. Well, it's great to be back, Jim. 
My guest has been Ted Dixon, CEO and co-founder of InkResearch.ca, Canada's first online financial news and research service. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio. Find us on Twitter at TalkDigitalNet. Our popular YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. Comments or questions for the show can be sent to info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Thanks for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com Radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. HowStreet.com Radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.